Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today in this talk, Machine Learning with PyCare. Uh, we have a tight agenda today. This is a one hour talk, so I'll introduce myself quickly. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, machine learning lifecycle in general at a very high level. Uh, after that, I'll introduce you to PyCare, uh, which is the talk is all about. I'll talk about what's and why's of PyCare. And then towards the end of the session, we have four demos. Uh, and I encourage you to follow along with me in that section. And then we'll end our talk uh, with question and answers. Okay, a little bit about myself. Name is Moiz Ali. I'm a data scientist. My background is in finance, economics, computer science, and data science. I have worked in industries like healthcare, education, consulting. And right now I'm working in FinTech space here in Toronto, Canada. And me and my team are solving some interesting time series problem. We are actually inventing some novel methods to predict the rebound of economy after COVID-19. So it involves a lot of economics, finance, as well as data science, machine learning. Uh, in last five years, uh, I lived in four different countries. I've lived and worked in four different countries and all of them happen to be in a different continent. Uh, these days I'm based in uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, my open source project, I, I do a lot of open source community work. Uh, the most uh, known work uh, that I've done is, is PyCare. Uh, you can see some links below down on this slide, my LinkedIn, my Twitter profile, Medium. I'm a very active blogger. I write at least three to four times a week, uh, and I write mostly about uh, beginner level citizen data scientist tutorials and something about data engineering too. Um, <clears throat> and there's my email in case you want to contact me. Some important links. Uh, so official website of PyCadet, GitHub, LinkedIn, uh, but the most important link here is this last link, github.com slash pycarrot slash pycarrot dash demo dash data AI 2021. So this presentation, as well as all the tutorials and notebooks and data sets that we are gonna use today, all of them are uploaded on, on this GitHub location. Please feel free to clone it and follow along with me in tutorial section if you want. Okay, so let's get started. So this is uh, what you see in front of you is a very high level machine learning life cycle which starts with business problems. So this is where business would make a use case of what, what they're trying to solve. Is it the regression? Is, are you trying to predict a continuous value or you are trying to predict an outcome or maybe you are not trying to predict anything. You just wanna uh, segment your customers in which case that would be a clustering uh, problem as you may guess. Uh, this is the most uh, important uh, stage. Uh, unfortunately, PyCarrot could not help you with the business problem or use case, you have to come up, uh, come, uh, come up with that by yourself. Uh, but once you have your business problem sorted out, uh, you have met your key stakeholders and you have agreed on the project timelines and deliverables, uh, you get into data sourcing and ETL stage. This is where you would usually uh, source the data from organizational enterprise database. This could be as simple as a local SQL server or something as complicated as a cloud managed data warehouse service, service like a Snowflake. And depending on the use case, sometimes you don't have data readily available. So for example, if we talk about customer churn prediction problem where you have to predict uh, whether the customer would leave or not, usually what you wanna do is predict it with some lag. You wanna predict in, in three months in advance or six months in advance, in which case you don't have that data sitting on the server like the way you want. Uh, you, you, you have to create that with lag, right? So data sourcing and ETL may also involve data generation processes sometimes depending on the use case. After data sourcing and ETL, uh, the, the, next step, the next step is exploratory data analysis. This is where you would uh, investigate or I would say uh, evaluate uh, your, your raw data and you would visualize it to, to figure out things like if data has missing values, what's the overall quality of data, how many uh, numeric categorical features it has, what's the correlation, what's the distribution, stuff like that. At this point, uh, modeling hasn't started yet. You are just checking out your data. Uh, and so normally data scientists would uh, do very detailed analysis and form some hypothesis or assumption that they would test or execute in steps ahead. Uh, the next step is data preparation. So this is different than ETL. Data preparation in context of machine learning would include things like your train test split uh, that you have to do. Uh, missing value imputation, scaling, transformations, feature engineering, feature extraction, so all, all that sort of thing that would make your data in a shape that is ready to be consumed by algorithms. 
the next step, uh, which, which most people are excited about this one, model training and selection, and as the name suggests, uh, what it involves is training multiple models, fitting multiple estimators, uh, and then tuning their hyperparameters, maybe ensemble them together through voting or stacking uh, regressor or classifier, depending on the use case, and then eventually uh, finalize one best model that you would use in production and satisfy some business objective. And naturally, the last stage of this process is you would take that one best model and that one best model may be out of 50 that you train, or maybe out of 500, or maybe out of 5,000. It could be anything, it depend on the use case and the level of accuracy or precision you are going after. And how do you know that? It, it totally depends on your business use case, right? Are you trying to detect a disease uh, where it's a matter of life or death? Or are you trying to do a, uh, whether the customer will respond to a market media, right? So this entire process is very iterative. It kind of runs in a loop. Uh, business problem is out of loop in this diagram, but that's because uh, once you agree on a business problem, you want to change it, right? If you change it, it's in my view, it's a new, new, new project. Uh, so this this entire iteration happens. Uh, so this uh, happens in, happens in a loop, right? Uh, and if I just drill down into these two aspects, because this is very high level workflow, if I drill down into data preparation uh, and model training and selection, what you would see is a, a very granular diagram, which looks like this. And if you read it from left to right, uh, you would see it starts from data, the first step in a typical machine learning or supervised machine learning experiment, the strain test is split. So you can see you have uh, your train data going right to the flow and test data is we, we have in the beginning, at the beginning of experiment, we have just taken our test data. Uh, we have locked it. We are not using it for anything. Uh, then you have the strain data. Uh, you will start by doing things like missing value imputation, scaling, encodings. If you have categorical features, you cannot directly consume them, right? You have to encode it uh, from something as simple as one hot encoding or maybe as complicated as uh, weight-based weight uh, encoding. And then you have things like feature engineering. And then at one point when you are done with preparing your data, uh, you, you, you enter into another loop, which is here in top in, in bottom right corner, uh, cross validation. This is where you take your data, which is now ready for modeling and you start fitting multiple models, multiple estimators, multiple algorithms, right? And you run into a mini loop where you train it, you tune, tune it, you ensemble it, and then you select one hour. And then again, you would see arrows going on the, in, in the left direction, uh, which basically means once you have that one final model, you would uh, apply it on test set to, uh, to before you actually, as, as your final check, before you take that model and put it in production, what you wanna do is evaluate it on test or holdout set to see if it's not overfitting or you have not messed up with your cross validation environment, right? And then you finalize your pipeline, uh, pipeline consists of all the transformation plus the estimator you deploy it, you keep monitoring and it would keep running in a loop, right? And the reason I say in a loop is because imagine your use case involves time series prediction at a skew level. Uh, and what you wanna do is you wanna retrain those models every month, every week or every day, depending on your use case. Uh, so you have to uh, set up this process in a way that you are able to retrain your models in, a, in an automated way in production. Okay. So what are the challenges then? So based on this process, if, if you look at it or think about it, uh, machine learning is an iterative process. And because it's iterative, it is very, very time consuming. Uh, right tooling in hands of right people is very important here. Uh, now, what is, what is changing in last few years is companies are now uh, establishing their data science teams, uh, which are functional. So data scientists in marketing, data scientists in finance, data scientists in HR. Uh, and and what, what happens with that shift is typically the, the, the persona of, of a data scientist, which is uh, normally very uh, computer science or statistics heavy, we are missing that when we are scaling the culture of data science and machine learning. The tools that are working for typical software engineers are not necessarily the same tools that will work for citizen data scientists. Uh, so right tooling with right people is, is, is very challenging here. Uh, I think creating seamless pipeline, uh, as, as we have seen on, on last slide, it's not only a model, but it's entire pipeline uh, that has to be in a sequence and orchestrated uh, that would actually satisfy your goal for the project. It's not just the model itself, but the entire pipeline. Uh, 
right? And managing it in production is even harder than creating it. Focusing on end goal and solving business problems is absolutely key. This is the whole idea. This is the reason we are doing this. And what happens in the smaller teams uh, that, that doesn't care about all this, uh, they take technical debt very quickly. Uh, and when that happens in small teams, uh, the, the, the focus of end goal and solving business problems can take backseat on the expense of maintaining code and maintaining technical infrastructure. And the final point, uh, which, which I'm sure everybody would agree with, is scalability is not just desirable today, it is very much needed. We have to take our models outside of notebook and only then it's useful, right? Only then it's serving some purpose, it's generating some revenue or minimizing some cost. Models in notebook eventually die. Okay. So what is PyCarrot? So PyCarrot is an open source low code machine learning library and it's an end to end model management tool. It basically means it takes you from data preparation to the last stage of the workflow that we have seen, which is deployment and monitoring. Uh, it is commonly used for rapid prototyping and deployment of pipelines on, on cloud, locally. And this is kind of our uh, key, key proposition. It's PyCarrot is extremely easy to use. It's, it's a productivity tool because it saves a lot of time and it's targeted, it's designed, it's intentionally designed, consciously designed for business audience. Features of PyCarrot, we have uh, data preparation. So this is things like missing value imputation, scaling, transformation, PCA, uh, model training, They're very self-explanatory involves training models. Hyperparameter tuning is hyperparameter tuning of model like it's self-explanatory. Analysis and interpretability involve things like you checking uh, AUC plot of your model, you checking confusion metrics of your model. If it's regression, you checking residuals plot of your model, QQ plot of your model. Uh, or you, you even checking sharp values of your model, that's, all, that's part of interpretation. Model selection is something uh, that happens naturally as you are doing all this, that's the whole point you are doing, right? So you can iterate this entire cycle and select one final model. So model selection is the natural outcome of this entire process. Experiment logging uh, is, is really important because as you iterate over that loop again and again, you generate tons of metadata points. Uh, sometimes in hundreds of thousands and sometimes in millions too, right? Imagine if you, if, if you have a use case of time series at a store and SKU level and you have 500 time series and you are training, let's say 50 models and you are hyperparameter, you're tuning the hyperparameters for 500 time series. Imagine for every model, you have at least 10 or 15 hyperparameters for every model, maybe you would keep track of five or six performance metrics like accuracy, AUC, recall, precision. And if you do the math, this would be millions of data points. So it is very important that you keep track of that, right? That they are very important. And PyCarrot has integration with MLflow, which is open source project by Databricks. Uh, and PyCarrot automatically uh, do that logging for you. And you will see that in, in, in demo. Okay, so the use case that are currently supported in PyCarrot is classification. This, this is where you predict discrete outcome, binary or multi-class, we call it classification. Uh, regression, which is predicting continuous value. Uh, these are supervised experiments, which means that you have to identify the target column in your data set, uh, which essentially means that you should have a labeled data set. Unsupervised modules include things like clustering, anomaly detection, association rule mining, and NLP. And we have a brand new module coming up in next couple of weeks, time series, uh, which we are very excited about. Okay, what you see here is one experiment that we have done, it's impact of PyCarrot. On your x-axis, what you see is the workflow, uh, data preparation, model training, model selection, model evaluation. This is the same workflow broken down in four categories. On y-axis, what you see is cumulative lines of code. So we have set up this experiment where we have designed a list of tasks, uh, so, which would involve things like preparing data or train test split or training multiple models analysis, and then uh, obtaining predictions. And we have performed those tasks using base scikit-learn code, uh, pandas code, all, all the base libraries. And then we have performed the same experiment uh, that produce the same results using PyCarrot. This green line here represents the scikit-learn and red line is PyCarrot. And you can see by the time we finished the experiment, uh, scikit-learn, we had to, scikit-learn pandas, numpy, we had to wrote around 170 lines of code. 
with PyCaret, we have got the same results with around 20 lines of code. So now, uh, if, if you think from the perspective of somebody not coming from computer science background, somebody coming from a domain or a functional expertise, for them, this is this is great motivation to, to get into this uh, or, to, or, to, or to basically get motivated to, to use these kind of technology to solve their problems. Okay, these are some numbers. So PyCaret, uh, our first uh, stable release uh, was uh, publicly announced in April of uh, 2020. So it's almost like a year. Uh, in last year, we have our, over more than 500,000 downloads. Uh, we have over 3,000 3, GitHub stars, uh, 1,700 comets. And the most important number here on this slide uh, that I'm very proud on of is, is contributors. We have about 46 contributors contributing to this project now. Uh, and I would you know, take this opportunity to, to, uh, to tell all of them that uh, this was not possible without them. So I, I'm very humble, very thankful to them. Here's our 46 contributors, uh, shout out to them. Okay, you can use PyCaret on CPU as well as on GPU. Uh, so if you have CUDA enabled GPU, which is compatible, uh, you can use PyCaret uh, without any additional configuration. There's just a parameter that you have to pass in, in, in the setup function. You would see that in demo uh, and, and that's it. Uh, but, but how we do it, we do it based on this project, Rapids AI project, and they have their two libraries, CUML and uh, CUDF, I think. Uh, this is amazing project and uh, uh, we are using uh, the, this library to provide you that GPU training functionality. Uh, similarly, if you have very big data sets and you are doing hyperparameter tuning, uh, PyCaret has integration with Ray, which provides this distributed uh, framework, distributed processing framework in Python. So again, these two great libraries have made it possible for us uh, to do what we are doing. There are a few more integrations. So you can see scikit-learn, Rapids. These are for model training. Ray is distributed processing. MLflow is for logging and MLOps. Uh, yellow break plotly is for uh, plotting and charting functionalities. Uh, Optuna is another uh, hyperparameter tuning library. Uh, Gensim Spacey is for our NLP module. So PyCaret was not possible without all these awesome, amazing open source projects. So, uh, so that's the acknowledgement. Okay, so this brings us to the final part of our presentation today. Uh, just a reminder, if you would like to follow the demos along with me, here's the GitHub link uh, from where you can download all these notebooks, github.com slash pycaret slash pycaret dash demo dash data AI 2021. With that, let's head over to notebook. Okay, here I am uh, on, on demo one regression. This is the first notebook. Um, if you do not have PyCaret installed, you can run pip install PyCaret either in your notebook or in command line. Uh, it would take a few minutes to install PyCaret. For this demo, I'm using this regression data set, which basically has each row is, is a patient, and there are six attributes of patient, which is age, sex, BMI, children, smoke, or region, based on which we have to predict charges column. It's a very small data set uh, just for the purpose of demonstration. Okay. So the first step in PyCaret in any experiment, whether it's regression, classification, clustering, it's all same, the API is unified. Uh, so the first step is to execute the setup function. And what setup does, it essentially prepares your data for modeling. So all the uh, data preparation steps, uh, such as train test split, scaling, transformation, one-hot encoding, missing value imputation, feature engineering, etc., etc. All of them are done at this stage. Uh, the setup function takes two parameters, uh, the data frame, which is this, this variable here, and the name of target column, which is charges. Uh, session ID is basically a random number that helps you reproduce this experiment at a later time. Let's run it. So when you execute this function, the first thing PyCaret would do is it would infer the data types for each column uh, and if you if you're okay with these data types, you can just press enter to continue. Uh, if you're not okay with the inferred data types, there's a way to override. Uh, if you read documentation, you would you would find out there's a way to override the inferred data types. Anyways, this function would return you if successfully completed would return you this 
the state this output which basically shows you a couple of important information you can see our session id is here name of target column what's the shape of original data set were there any missing values uh, how many features were numeric how many were categorical so and so forth and you can see uh, the split was done here train 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 set has 900 raws uh, test set has 400 raws so it's a 70 and 30 percent split by default but you can change that percentage uh, there are a bunch of other information such as fold generator, uh, shuffling, uh, how many how many cores you can use use in your CPU by default set to minus one, which basically means all the cores. Uh, you can use PyCat on GPU. So uh, if you have a NVIDIA CUDA enabled GPU, you can pass use underscore GPU is equal to true uh, like this, and all the workload uh, would fall on GPU if you have one. Uh, I don't have GPU on this computer, so I'm gonna just get rid of this. Run it again. Okay, here's how you can access the transform train set, get config x train. Uh, so you can access a bunch of variables that are created in the background. This is the list of all variables you can use get config function to access them. And if you notice, you would see that we have a bunch of new columns here. Uh, they are the result of one hot encoding on categorical features. There you go. All these columns are one hot encoded categorical features. Okay. So now that data is ready for modeling, the first function we recommend uh, in any supervised experiment in PyCaret is this compare model function. Uh, let me just run it. Uh, what, hap what is happening here now is all the available models in our model library, we are training them one by one uh, using k-fold cross-validation on tra train set. And what you see here are the metrics uh, using cross-validation. And this table is ordered into highest to lowest performing model. Uh, so let's see, let's let, let this one finish first. Okay, so here we see all the train models and their metrics using k-fold cross-validation. By default, it uses 10-fold, but you can change the uh, number of folds by passing fold parameter uh, in compare models, or even in setup. You can also pass fold parameter in the setup. Okay, so we have our best model, which is gradient boosting regressor doing $2,700 in mean absolute error. Let's just see what is it. So this is gradient boosting regressor and these are all the default hyperparameters of this model. Let's check the type. So as you can see, this is scikit-learn GBR. All right, while compare models is a very good function to, to have, a, ha, have a baseline or a starting point ready, uh, create model is more granular function and it basically trains one model at a time. So if I say create model DT, DT is ID for decision tree. And if you check the documentation here, you would see all the models here with their IDs. So LR is for linear regression, lasso is for lasso regression, so on and so forth. We have used this one, DT. If you wanna train support vector machine, the ID for support vector machine is SVM. And there you go, it's the same thing. Now each raw here represents a fold, right? Uh, there are 10 folds, so you can see zero to nine. Uh, if you want to change the fold, you can just say fold is equal to three. Now you have three folds. Uh, and there's a mean, which is basically average of each fold and standard deviation. What you see here in compare models is basically the mean cross-validated score, right? All right, let's set it back to DT. Let's print DT. So this is decision tree doing $3,148 in mean absolute error. And if you see the uh, the hyperparameters, these are the default hyperparameters of decision tree. Now you can tune decision tree with this tune model function. Let me just run it. And let's see from $3,148, we have gone to $2,051 by tuning the hyperparameters of this model. How do we get the hyperparameters of this model? Behind the scene, we have dynamically defined uh, the hyperparameter search space for, for, for each of the estimator and based on which estimator you are using, we are gonna use that search space to iterate our parameters randomly. Now, if you want to pass your own search space, you can pass custom grid here in this function and then instead of using our uh, defined grids, we'll use the grid that you pass. Uh, one thing to note is by default, we are using uh, 
random random grid search, uh, which basically means that we randomly iterate over combination of hyperparameters to find the best uh, combination of parameters. But there are other methods and probably more effective methods to tune the hyperparameters of your model. And those methods include things like uh, Bayesian grid search or tree-based grid search. And there are a couple of open source libraries that provides that functionality. The problem is the API for each of them is, is different. So in PyCaret, you can actually parse search library and let's say Optuna is one of that um, um, hyperparameter tuning library. And now if you run this, now the search space is same, but this time PyCaret is using the methods defined by Optuna to iterate over the search space. Uh, uh, similarly, we have scikit optimize, and there are a few other options uh, that, that you, you can check uh, at your own time. Um, and, and if you have a very large data set, uh, PyCaret has integration with Ray, so you can actually tune the hyperparameters uh, of your model on, on a cluster. Okay. Similarly, we have an ensemble model function, which basically takes your estimator and wrap it around bagging or boosting estimator. So in this case, we have a decision tree that we tuned, and then we pass the de tuned decision tree with these hyperparameters into ensemble model. And now if I show you what is my ensemble model, this is the same decision tree uh, wrapped around bagging regressor. Okay. Now, uh, if, if, if you have heard about bagging regressor, you would know number of estimators is really important. So by default, it's set to 10, but if you wanna increase, you can obviously take this parameter and now fit, let's say 25. So now this would this would repeat the, uh, this would build the trees 25 times instead of 10 times by default. And as, as you can see, the performance has improved a little bit as I increase my number of estimators. But, but you have to be careful about overfitting when you do things like this. Okay. Uh, there is another way of ensembling models, which is basically you can train individual models and then blend them together, which is take their predictions and average them in some way, weighted average or some kind of uh, normal average. So here I'm training three separate models, decision tree, lasso regression, and KNN, and passing them into blend models function as a list. Uh, and what you see here is the same uh, tenfold uh, performance metrics. And if I show you Blender, this is your voting regressor from scikit-learn and all are these all these are your estimators that you passed inside the list. The type of this is ensemble voting regressor from scikit-learn. Similarly, we have stacking, which is uh, which is also ensembling technique, works a little bit different. Uh, it, instead of taking a voting, it basically takes the input of these estimators, uh, uh, output of these estimators as an input for a meta model, and then train a final meta model based on these inputs. It's like neural network without back propagation. So you can see we have this models here, decision tree, K neighbors, and lasso uh, wrapped inside stacking regressor. Okay, we have a function, so now that we have uh, train bunch of models uh, and we have now our best model we can analyze the performance uh, using a few plots uh, so now I'm passing my best model which is gradient boosting regressor into evaluate model and you can you would see this nice little UI uh, where you, the, the selection at the moment is hyperparameter so you see this but you can actually uh, see the residual plot uh, you can see uh, feature importance uh, if it's available you can see a bunch of other things, uh, Cook's distance, prediction error, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have another function called interpret model, uh, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, there's a library in Python called SHAP, uh, which kind of is, is a way to, to interpret your complex tree-based models. Uh, it, is, it is not very easy to explain the results of this in, in such a short time. Uh, but the code is here uh, just so in case uh, you want to use it in future. Okay, so now that we have our model, uh, let's see the performance of this model on test set, right? Because so far, what, whatever we have seen is the cross-validation performance. Now, if you use this function here, predict model and just pass your best model without passing any data set, PyCaret would know that you want to check the score on holdout set. So in this case, uh, my gradient boosting regressor is doing 2386 on holdout set. Uh, and if I check my cross validation, 
2702 so even better uh, the difference between the cross validation metrics and holdout if it's very large difference uh, it kind of indicates overfitting and under or underfitting in this case i'm not worried i'm just gonna go ahead so here i have used predict model and stored it in pred holdout uh, variable now if i show you the head of this this is your test set uh, and you would have label column towards the end which is your uh, predictions and these are scores that you see here is basically uh, metrics ran on these two so this is your actual this is your prediction right now more likely you would be interested in using this model to generate predictions on new data set where you don't have target variable or label right uh, to do that I don't have any uh, production uh, data set for insurance so I'm gonna copy the same data set drop the charges column uh, and create a new data set which looks exactly like this except there's no target column uh, this line here is finalized model best this actually means that remember uh, when we initialize the setup uh, the data set was split into two parts train and test right all the modeling that we have done so far is on train set only finalized model would basically take your model and the same hyperparameters and it would just refit one final time including the test set so it would fit it on entire data set because you don't want to leave your test set on the table now you can use best final under the predict model function and pass your data which is data 2 which is this table here and it would return you pandas data frame with your original uh, uh, features and the label column which is your prediction notice that what you see is a human readable output uh, now models are not consuming these variables like sex smoker region as it is they are transforming them uh, encoding them uh, but when it returns you the table you see human readable output everything is happening all the complexities handled under the hood safe model here is how you can save your entire pipeline so save model best final so now you see it's not just an estimator but it's a pipeline uh, which has a couple of steps and the last step is our model here this is the model but everything else is transformers uh, how big or small pipeline is is dependent on uh, what you do in the setup function uh, this time we haven't used any functionality for for pre-processing but we have few simple things here like data inference uh, uh, missing value imputer and uh, one hot encoder okay with load model you can load your pipeline back and if I just visualize this pipeline you would see we have auto inference we have imputer we have new categorical levels how well, how to how to deal with new categorical levels uh, when you have new levels in your uh, production data uh, then you have a bunch of other 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 transformers and here's your model at the end gradient boosting aggressor uh, this function here deploy model can basically take your entire pipeline and deploy it on AWS Azure or GCP in this case I'm using AWS I have my bucket name here pycadet dash test if I just run this this would take the entire pipeline and push it to AWS S3 and here you can use load model uh, to read this pipeline back from AWS this function works the similar way for all all the cloud services like if you want to push it to Azure you would just replace this term with Azure okay now we have this loaded pipeline if I show you again this is the same pipeline so here I have locally here I have loaded this I've loaded this pipeline uh, using my uh, local drive uh, here I have loaded it from AWS it's it's this exact same pipeline okay with that let's head over to our second demo here which is time series okay so I'm using this data set here which is US air passengers data set that has uh, monthly airline passenger numbers from 1949 to 1960 uh, let's quickly plot this data set uh, over line plot okay so this is how it looks like so you can see starts from 1949 goes until 1960 uh, and this blue line you can see the peaks and lows uh, this is basically the summer and winter seasonality uh, red line here is the moving average for last 12 months that we created here this line here now if you just see the moving average you would see there's an inclining trend and that's the reason I captured moving average um, 
So this time, uh, even before you start your modeling with PyCare, what you have to do is extract the features from date. So this data set here, you cannot consume dates directly for modeling. So you have to extract features such as the month, day, if it's a daily data, in this case, it's not year, is quarter end, is month end, stuff like that, right? So I have basically converted my this original data set, uh, which looks like this, into something which looks like this. In this case here, my passengers become my target feature and all these are my X features. I'm doing a train test split before the setup command. So I'm creating two different data set out of this. One is train, one is test. And this time I'm explicitly passing train and test set to PyCaret. Uh, uh, normally if you don't pass a test set uh, separately, PyCaret would do a train test split randomly, but here I'm explicitly passing it. Uh, target is passengers fold strategy time series uh, because by default PyCat uses a random cross validation with time series you cannot do that you have to uh, you have to respect the order in your in your data which is uh, the date order uh, in this case uh, numeric features so I'm explicitly passing the data type uh, into PyCat so I don't want PyCat to infer this I'm just explicitly defining it fold pre so threefold time series validation transform target true so because the, the the target here air passengers us passengers it's not it's not a stationary it's it's a moving average uh, the the moving average is is inclining right so what i'm doing is i'm in order to model better with my linear algorithms or regression algorithms i'm just doing transformation on target variable not on x features but the target itself so by default it would use box cox transformation there are a bunch of other options such as yo johnson quantile uh, by default, it's going to do box box transformation, but everything is going to happen under the hood, which basically means you can simply call the predict of the model and it would predict the transform target variable. But when it returns the output to you, it's going to inverse it. So it would return the output in the actual scale, but all the complexity is happening underneath. Session ID is same, same concept. It's a random state. Silent true, so the, when you pass silent true, the setup function would not ask you for that confirmation where you press enter. So imagine if you wanna run this as a script in your production, you don't wanna have PyCaret conforming data types, right? You would explicitly define types and just say silent is equal to true. These three variables here, log experiment true, experiment name, and log plots true. So this is uh, because PyCaret is integrated with MLflow, uh, when you pass these parameters here in setup, what we do is all any metadata that you create in your modeling process, such as your uh, hyperparameters of your model, performance metrics on cross validation, or even the model artifacts itself, like model pickle pickle file or even plots, you PyCaret would automatically log everything. And at the end of the experiment, we can just initiate an MLflow server on our local host, and you would see there is a very nice looking UI and very very useful. Let's run this function. Okay, this time noticed it didn't ask me for any confirmation because of this silent true. If I just set it to false, you would see it. It usually asks this, but if you are running this as a script, you really don't need it. You can just say silent true. Okay, you can see my index in X train set starts from 0 to 131. I'm expecting test set to start from 132. So all these last 12 points are for 1960. Okay, same thing, we'll start with compare models. This time we are fitting three folds because we pass fold is equal to three explicitly. And this is not random cross validation. This is time series uh, rolling window cross validation. Okay. So we have, it's almost done. Okay, so our batch model based on cross validation is least angle regression with a mean absolute error of 22. Uh, let's remove ML flow now. So you see our best model here is this one. It's wrapped around the power transformer because of that target transform parameter we passed in setup. Let's check the holdout score. It's 25. Compared to 22, not bad. We can check evaluate model, feature importance, prediction error, cook's distance. Okay, now I'm gonna plot this 
And so you have these two lines, uh, blue and red. Blue is your actual, red is your fitted line, which is prediction. And this, uh, this gray backdrop towards the end is our test set. So this is 1960, last 12 points of 1960. And if you, if you compare this, uh, it, it looks like a good fit. Okay, now I'm creating a future data set here because I don't have any, any X variable like you would have normally in regression. So I'm creating a future data set that it starts from 1961, goes till 1965. Uh, so this is exactly what our original data set looked like. I'm gonna finalize my model, least tenure regression. Uh, and now I'm gonna generate predictions on the future data set. So now you can see from 1961, label column is our predictions. Let's plot it together with our original data set. And this is what we see. So all these blue points here, this is your actual, which ends in 1960. And from that point onwards, this is your prediction. Ah, I'd say look good. Okay. Now, remember we have passed log experiment is equal to true in setup, right? Um, where is it? This, this thing here. Now let's see what's the, what's the effect of this. With this command here, mlflow UI, you can initiate a server on your local host. So if I run it, let's give it a minute. Okay. All right. So what you see here is air passengers. This is the name of experiment we defined in the setup function you'd see a bunch of runs by their timestamp. And uh, what you see here is uh, all the individual models. So when we ran compare models, it has trained bunch of models, right? So each model is a run here. And you would see a lot of things here, which is the parameters, their performance metric. Let's click one of it. So least angle regression, date, time, all the parameters, all the metrics of least angle regression, some tags, and you would see this results that it's the same table that we see in the notebook, but it's now logged as an artifact. And then you have model here. So you can actually call off this and score your, 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 your new, new, new data set. Right. Okay. Let's go back and stop this. Okay. Let me head over to demo three, which is multiple time series with logging this notebook here. So what I've done is in the interest of time, I have pre-run this notebook already. So this is the data set. Uh, it's, uh, it's, all, it's uploaded on the GitHub repo store demand. I've sourced this data set from Kaggle. And what this data set is, it's a time series data set for 10 different stores. Uh, and each store has 50 SKUs. So basically, around 500 different time series at daily level from 2013 to, I think it's a five year data set. Uh, and if you see, it's a 913,000 records by four column. Uh, what I've done here is I've just filtered one store, uh, just to kind of uh, show, show, show the demonstration. Uh, so one store would basically means 50 different time series because each store has 50 SKUs. Uh, here I've done the same thing. I've extracted the features just like uh, we have done in last tutorial, but you, you can see we have some extra features here like day of the week or day of the year because it's a daily level data set unlike the last one which was monthly. And we have this column here time series which is just a unique key. So it would have a store one item one, a store one item two, a store one item three. And if I just call n unique of this, you'd see there are 50 time series. Let's just visualize three of them. You see the first one is store one item one. This is how, this is how it looks like. Uh, red line is moving average. Let's see store one item two, store one item three. All of them looks pretty much same, but notice the Y axis for, for all of them are different. So the scale is different. Okay, here's our training loop. So uh, what I'm doing here is uh, importing PyCadet regression and then just running a loop over time series unique values. So a loop that would run 50 times uh, set up. Uh, so the first step inside the loop is it would filter the data set to that particular time series and then would just execute setup based on that. Again, you can see I am explicitly defining data types and that's why I'm passing silent is equal to true. This time also passing verbose is equal to false because I don't want to output uh, as the code is running. Uh, again, log experiment, experiment name, and log plots uh, is true. 
So once this function completes, you can see it takes about 19 minutes uh, to, 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 to get to, to train 50 different time series. So in this 19 minutes for each time series, we are training 25 models uh, and, and, and then selecting one final model. Uh, so for 50, 50 time series, it's 50 times 25. So we have trained so many models. This this table here is basically shows you each row here is the time series and this would basically show you for each time series which one was the best model. So in this case for store one item one, Bayesian Ridge was the best model with uh, 3.7 in MAE for item two, there's Ridge regression, so and so forth. Again, creating future data set and scoring it. And when I show you this on plot, this is what it looks like. So store one item one, we have the blue line, which is actual red line is fitted line. And from this point onwards, it's prediction. So you can see it's, it looks like a, looks like a good fit. Yep. Okay. Now let's see, because we are logging this experiment, let's see ML flow local host 5,000. If I go here, you would see for each, for each time series, I have the experiments here. So I have about 50 experiments in total. Let's go into one of it. Again, under each time series, we have trained multiple models, 25 of them, and let's just click on. So this is the best model for item one, Bayesian Ridge, the parameters of Bayesian Ridge, metrics, and the artifacts. So you have res uh, results, which is the same grid as you would see in Excel, in, 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 in your notebook, residuals plot, error plot, holdout score, feature importance, and the artifacts itself. So now at this point, you can actually load this model from this location uh, using load model function and, and you can do your scoring. You'd also notice there's a button here called register model, which is basically MLflow's native functionality of serving model. So if you click here, create a new model, let's say test one, this won't work at this point because What's happening is when you don't define a URI, which is a backend, by default, MLflow uses file system. And when you're using file system, you cannot use this functionality of MLflow. So for that, let me head over to the last demo here, uh, which is demo4.py file. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit. So what we have here is a command line script where I have created a function called run. I'm using the same insurance data set that we have used in first demo. Here's your setup function, which is passing the target data log experiment and experiment name. And beneath the setup function, I have created a list of four models. So it's ID for four, four individual models, linear regression, decision tree, like GBM, random forest. And then I'm creating a simple loop uh, list comprehension for create model function. So basically it would train these four models. And I'm doing that just in the interest of time, you can technically have a compare models here instead of uh, using create model. Uh, what is different here? The only thing I want you to note is here line number seven. So I'm explicitly before running setup, I'm explicitly defining the tracking URI and in, in the in the parentheses I'm passing SQLite ML runs DB. So now this would tell MLflow to create a database SQLite database file instead of using file system. And so you'd be able to uh, use that functionality of a model serving through MLflow. To run this script, I'm gonna open my command line, go to the same uh, location where this uh, file is, uh, which is data AI 2021 directory. You can see I have demo four here and let's just execute this Python demo 4.5. Okay, it's training linear regression. <clears throat> Let's give it a minute here. So what I'm going to do now, once this is completed, we would initialize the MLflow server uh, using the same command MLflow UI. But this time, the only thing different is we would pass this parameter as well, backend store URI and the name of database. And you can see as MLflow is running, I have this new file created in my folder, mlruns.db. It's a database file. Uh, okay, now this is completed. Let's copy this command and initialize the server. Okay. Let me open localhost now. 
All right, you see we have insurance demo four and we have multiple runs here. So we have random forest, let's go to random forest. Uh, we have our artifacts, plots, let's go to model. And now this time let's register the model. Create new one and I would say my first model. Register. So there is no error this time. And if you notice, click on this, you have your model here. Version one, a random forest model. So this is now an API that you can use to, to score your prediction. Let's, before we do that, let's just go and pick few other models. So you can see this icon here, which kind of says it's an API. Let's go to light GBM and decision tree. And let's register light GBM my first model let's register it and also let's register decision tree as my first model and now if i go to models you would see that we have three versions the first version is random forest second version is uh, light gbm and this is decision tree i'll head over to my notebook and this is demo for notebook and i'll just show you how how we can use these apis to score right so i'll just create a data set, uh, insurance data set, I'll remove the target column. And now I've created this function, which is kind of, again, pointing to the same tracking URI. Uh, and it's uh, it's basically calling the predict function. So let's run this. Now, all I have to do is pass my data. What is the name that I have registered the model from and the version number here, right? So if I run this, you see, you got the predictions. Now this one, because number one model was random forest. So these predictions are from random forest. Now version two is like GBM. So you can see the predictions are also different. And version three is uh, decision tree, right? So you can see now like you're literally using different estimators and you can now combine them or whatever you want to do with them, right? This is equivalent to, if you were to go in here uh, and let's find our random forest model. Oops. Uh, this one. If if you were to load this model from this file here and then use PyCarrots functionality, you would basically get the exact same answer. So both are equivalent. The difference is PyCarrots native functionality is using this as a file system. Here you can use it as, as in published API. All right. So now this brings us to end of our demo and I would be happy to take any questions in the chat.